Coming up next, we will have an overview of BirdLife South Africa's conservation work. We hope that you are enjoying the virtual African Bird Fair. Hi everyone and welcome to the Virtual African Bird Fair. I'd like to talk you through just an introduction to BirdLife South Africa's conservation division and the different programs and projects within this division and the work that we undertake. So BirdLife South Africa's mission is to conserve birds and their habitats and also other biodiversity, so biodiversity as a whole through scientifically based programs. So um, everything that we do is based on defendable science and through supporting the sustainable and equitable use of natural resources. And by doing so, it's impossible to exclude people. Um, the environment and people are so narrowly integrated and we need the support of people to really make the required change to save our birds and their habitats. And we also work with people to encourage them to enjoy and to value nature. And that enjoyment um, of nature is very much strongly linked to birding tourism and avi tourism. And our community bird guide program is central um, to our avi tourism project. So we've produced a red data book. So we've produced the 2015 ESCOM red data book of birds of the region, as well as a directory on the most important habitats for birds in South Africa. So important bird and biodiversity areas. As you can imagine, it's, it's rather hard to prioritize on which species we should focus. Um, and therefore we need these publications just to direct us um, in terms of our focus. I'd also just like to mention that we form part of BirdLife International, so international partnership with our uh, main or head office in Cambridge. And then we have more than 120 partners around the world that belongs to BirdLife International. So BirdLife South Africa's conservation strategy is very much strongly aligned with BirdLife International's nine global programs. And as I mentioned, in terms of prioritization, we have 102 of our bird species in South Africa that's listed as either as threatened or near threatened. Um, and pertinent groups within that threatened bird species are seabirds. So um, specifically, our seabird species are very threatened, as well as our raptors are more on the land bird side. And a quarter of South Africa's raptors are classified as threatened. So our strategy is not only aligned to BirdLife International's global programs, but it's also informed and aligned with global priorities. And those global priorities include the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the different conventions. And I'd just like to single out one convention here, and that's the Convention on Biological Diversity. And those key decisions that will be taken next year that will guide us for the next 10 years in terms of this convention and the same with the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So locally, we also focus um, on what's happen happening in terms of our national priorities. So in terms of our environmental laws, so we focus on the Biodiversity Act, as well as the Protected Areas Act, as well as national legislation. So as an example, the National Protected Areas Expansion Strategy and then we have the National um, Development Plan and the most recent publication highlighting those most threatened habitats, freshwater ecosystems, as an example, is highlighted in the National Biodiversity Assessment as severely threatened and in need of conservation action. So our strategy um, also addresses pertinent current and future conservation issues. So with our focus on protecting bird species and their habitats, we've built in a focus on biodiversity conservation. So um, conserving the entire ecosystem, building in climate change related work. So climate resilience into our projects with a big focus on strategic water source areas and a focus on assisting on the expansion of that National Protected Area Expansion Strategy, specifically through working with private landowners and biodiversity stewardship. We also focus on ecological restoration or green infrastructure, and through this we also contribute to the economy. And another example of how we contribute to the economy is supporting our biodiversity economy through our AV tourism project and creating job opportunities uh, through this project. So this is the incredible, hardworking, dedicated conservation team of BirdLife South Africa. 
And in um, a final sort of takeaway message from here is to show you the structure of the conservation division. So different conservation programs and then the different program managers and the different project managers will lead you through the work that's undertaken by the conservation division. So we have six main programs. We have a seabird conservation program, a landscape conservation program that's focused more on the land birds here in South Africa. Um, with two different subdivisions on protecting ecosystems and protecting species. Then the Empowering People program that's focused on avi tourism, but also on education and community upliftment, ensuring that we secure our conservation investments. And then original conservation is to work beyond South Africa's borders with a big focus on habitat-based conservation key biodiversity areas, as well as other effective area-based conservation measures, as well as red listing. And then another two programs supporting these other four programs, science and innovation that works across these different programs, doing our own scientific work, focusing on species distribution, bottling, just as one example, also doing our red listing work, and then policy and advocacy, again, making sure that we safeguard our conservation investments um, both on the seabird as well as on the land bird side. Thank you so much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the day with us. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us at the Virtual African Bird Fair. My name is Christina Hagen and I will be telling you about the work that we do at the Seabird Conservation Programme here at BirdLife South Africa. We're lucky enough in South Africa to have a high abundance and diversity of seabirds and about 59 pelagic species and 25 coastal species frequent our waters. Sadly, of these, about 19 are threatened with extinction. And that's where the Seabird Conservation Program comes in. Led by Dr. Alistair McInnes, we are a small team of passionate conservationists working to conserve South Africa's seabirds. Our program can be divided broadly into projects on pelagic seabirds that forage further offshore and coastal seabirds that are resident in our territorial waters. For pelagic species globally, the greatest threat is associated with um, accidental mortality in fishing operations, known as bycatch. Our Albatross Task Force focuses on minimizing this threat to seabirds across several different fishing fleets in South Africa. It's led by Andrea Angel with Reason Yangera as the project manager. Our island restoration project is focused on the other main threat to pelagic seabirds, invasive mammalian predators on their breeding islands. Lini Fanomeva is our island restoration project manager and she's working on two projects that focus on invasive species eradication from islands. The coastal seabird team is mostly focused on three endangered Benguela endemic seabirds, the African penguin, the Cape Gannet and the Cape Cormorant, although most of our work to date has focused on the African penguin. Our work primarily focuses on securing at sea habitat for these specialist hunters that focus on sardine and anchovy, which also are the target of a commercial fishing industry. We're also attempting to create new colonies in areas of high food availability and where there's little competition with the fisheries. The team includes Alistair and Tegan Carpenter Kling, who are working more on the fishery side and myself working on the new colony project. The Albatross Task Force team in South Africa is one of five teams around the world working to prevent seabird bycatch. Albatrosses, petrels and shearwaters are the most affected as they spend most of their lives at sea in search of food, which they can often find by scavenging behind fishing vessels. Pelagic seabirds face a myriad of threats, but, but by far the most important of these are introduced predators on their breeding islands and bycatch. The Albatross Task Force takes a multi-pronged approach involving engagement at four main levels. At sea, they go on trips on fishing vessels to conduct research and monitoring of seabirds, as well as looking at the effectiveness of mitigation measures, working with the crew, which also helps raise awareness of this issue amongst fishers. Onshore, they do a lot of harbour visits and engagement with fishers and crew in port, to gather further information and build up relationships. They also run workshops and training courses for fishers and other organizations such as fishery observer agencies. 
We also work with partners such as WWF and the Marine Stewardship Council who offer market incentives for sustainable fishing. And one of our flagship projects is a community project with a group of people with disabilities in a marginalized community. And finally, in conjunction with other partners, we work with the government to advocate for improved legislation and compliance relating to bycatch. South Africa has several legislated seabird bycatch mitigation measures as part of fishery permit conditions. The first is the bird scaring line, which is required by all trawl and long line fleets, and it works by keeping the birds away from the dangerous areas, either close to the trawl wall cables or to the baited hooks. Managing offal discards is vital to reduce the incentive for birds to forage behind fishing vessels, thus putting them in danger. Night setting on longline vessels reduces the interactions with seabirds as most birds don't forage at night, although there are still issues around the full moon and with certain species. Adding weight to longline hooks causes them to sink faster and out of reach of foraging seabirds. Finally, the hook pod is an all-in-one solution for fleets using hooks. It shields the baited hook until it reaches a predetermined depth where the device opens and allows fishing to take place, but only once the bait is out of reach of diving seabirds. One of the important objectives of the ATF is, in, is to ensure that the fishing industry has access to effective seabird bycatch mitigation measures. So since 2011, we have been working with the Ocean View Association for Persons with Disabilities, and they manufacture the bird scaring lines, which are then sold to the fishing industry. The project makes a significant dif difference to an otherwise, otherwise marginalized people, enabling them to support their families. We've had several achie achievements in the ATF since its inception in 2006. There's been a 99% reduction in albatross deaths in the trawl fishery due to the introduction of bird scaring lines from over 7,000 birds killed annually to fewer than 100. Similarly, in the joint venture long line fleet, close to 3,000 birds were killed each year. By ensuring compliance with mitigation measures, we've managed to reduce this by 85%. And the ATF isn't resting on their laurels though. They are still working with these fleets and others to ensure that seabed bycatch is reduced as much as possible. And now on to the second major threat facing pelagic seabirds, invasive species on their breeding islands. Oceanic islands are critical for most pelagic seabirds. Historically, they were free from land-based predators providing safe space to breed, and they're also close to productive high seas breeding, feeding grounds. Although islands only represent 5% of the Earth's land mass, they contain 19% of the alien diversity. Unfortunately, most extinctions have occurred on islands, and 86% of these have been linked to invasive species. So it's vital that we remove these invasive species from these highly sensitive habitats. Most invasive species were introduced to the islands unintentionally as stowaways on whaling and sealing vessels hundreds of years ago. But as international trade and sea transport has increased, invasive species have moved to more and more remote locations. And once they arrive on the island, there is no natural competition or predation, and so their populations explode. And in the case of rodents, they can have a devastating impact on the vegetation, the invertebrates, and the seabirds. The most effective way of managing, managing these invasive species is through eradication. Please note that the next slide contains some graphic images, so sensitive viewers, please look away now. On Gough Island, research has shown that the mice there are 50% larger than the average house mouse. And they prey on eggs, chicks, and as has been discovered recently, the adult birds. The seabirds that breed on these islands haven't developed any defense mechanisms against predation. And so heartbreakingly, they are eaten alive. As island restoration expert Keith Broom has said, eradication is not control. 
which requires the removal of every individual from the island. If this isn't achieved, that means failure. So to achieve the eradication, grain-based pellets with trace amounts of rodificum, or rodent poison, are dispersed over the island using helicopters. Red Life South Africa is involved in two ambitious island restoration projects, the Gough Island Restoration Program led by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds in conjunction with the Tristan de Cunha government, and that's planned for 2021. And then the Mastery Marion Project, which is led by the South African Department for Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, and that's planned for 2023. So watch this space. Red Life South Africa also works on coastal seabirds, and we have several species that are endemic to the Benguela plant ecosystem. And unfortunately, a lot of them are threatened from similar threats due to a lack of prey avail availability. And for this reason, the CBO team works very closely with the government and fishing industry uh, to advocate for what's known as an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. And this is a more holistic approach that incorporates ecosystem and socioeconomic concerns into fisheries management rather than the conventional approach that is centered around a single target species. We're also working on different approaches to integrate ecosystem concerns into the way catch limits are set for sardine and adjuvi. And the reason that we're focusing on sardine and adjuvi is that they are the key prey species for three out of our four most threatened coastal seabirds. One of the uh, good examples of an EAF approach is the African Penguin Island Enclosure Project. We've been working closely with other NGOs, seabird scientists and the government to assess the impact of fishing around four different African penguin breeding colonies. And this has been going on for the last 12 years, but we are now at a point hopefully where the results of this experiment will be used by the government fisheries managers to make a decision about limiting resource competition in sensitive penguin habitats. And the reason that we're focusing on the African penguins so closely is that their population has decreased dramatically in the last 20 years. They were from over a million pairs in, in the early 1900s to about 13,000 in South Africa today. And this, the main driver of this population decrease, especially in the last few years, is has been a shift in the distribution of their prey, as well as a re reduced availability, as well as competition with fisheries. Due to the massive collaborative effort as part of the island closure experiment, we now know where the penguins go while they're breeding and we can protect those areas. But once they no longer need to return to the islands to feed their chicks, African penguins can range very widely and often far out of the boundaries of marine protected areas. So since 2012, we've been tracking non-breeding African penguins from three colonies in South Africa. And we're now at the point where we can analyze these data and feed them into new marine protected area expansions. The other way that we are helping to address the threat of lower food availability for penguins is by attempting to create new breeding colonies for them in areas of high fish abundance. Working with Cape Nature and other penguin experts, we identified the De Hoop Nature Reserve as a suitable site to start. The penguins tried to breed there themselves, but ultimately abandoned the colony because of predation. So in order to stop this from happening again, we have put in a predator-proof fence and are monitoring the site remotely. Lifelike penguin decoys scattered throughout the area and penguin calls being broadcast continuously help to give the impression that penguins already breed there, enticing any passing birds to come ashore. While we're waiting for this to happen, we are working with Sankov to plan for the release of young penguins at the site. When they're ready to breed, they will hopefully return to the Hoop and make this the first human-assisted seabird colonization in South Africa. And none of this work would be possible without the generous support of our sponsors and the important collaborations that we have with our partners. So I'd like to take this opportunity on the behalf of the Seabird team to thank each and every one of them. And thank you very much for attending the Bird Fair. Hello, my name is Melissa House whitecross and I'm the Landscape Conservation Program Manager at BirdLife South Africa. My position is kindly sponsored by the Rupert Natur Stiftung as well as ESCOM through the Angula Partnership. 
The Landscape Conservation Program is focused on the conservation of South Africa's most threatened terrestrial or land-based birds and their habitats. The program is divided into two sub-programs, with the first focusing on species and targeted threat mitigation approaches, and this is called the Protecting Species Program. The second has a focus on the safeguarding of priority sites and restoration of key ecosystems, and this is undertaken by the Protecting Ecosystems team. The program's vision is to ensure the preservation of critical sites and their ecological services through sustainable management and legally protected status for our sites. So as to promote the sustained and healthy populations of birds and biodiversity that are enjoyed, valued and supported by the communities who live alongside them. Birds are particularly good in indicator species of environmental change as they are highly adapted to the habitats in which they occur and are often able to depart from any area where conditions are no longer optimal. We can use this mechanism to understand changes within our landscapes, and this can often alert us as to where the conservation interventions are most needed. South Africa is blessed with approximately 856 species of birds, and approximately 8% of these species are endemic to the region, which means that they are found nowhere else on Earth. Our conservation of these species is of particular importance. Unfortunately, roughly 15% of South Africa's birds are currently threatened. If we have a look at these threatened species in the terrestrial realm, we can see that the majority of the terrestrial birds fall into four categories, the raptors, the large terrestrial birds, the water birds, and then of course all the other birds. If we look at South Africa's ecosystems, the recent National Biodiversity Assessment published by the South African National Biological Institute, also known as SANBI, highlights that habitat alteration and degradation is the most significant threat facing biodiversity within the country. You can see the dark red areas on the map showing the highest rates of habitat loss in our country between 1990 to 2014, largely centered around the grasslands and the east coast of South Africa, with high rates of transformation across the Fynbos in the Western Cape. To combat the rapid changes to our natural world, the Landscape Conservation Program has prioritized our conservation work into three key biomes, namely the grasslands, estuaries and forests the three most threatened ecosystems, according to the Sandby report. We are also actively involved in the securing of vulture safe zones across South Africa. The recently developed environmental site screening tool, which highlights the most sensitive biodiversity areas in South Africa, confirms that we are working in some of the most ecologically key landscapes. Thank you for joining us at the, African, the virtual African Bird Fair. I will now hand over to our landscape conservation team to tell you a bit more about their respective projects starting off with Dr. Giselle Merrison. Hello and welcome. My name is Giselle Merrison. I am BirdLife South Africa's Estuaries Conservation Project Manager based out of Cape Town in the Western Cape. And in this project, it's all about estuaries. Estuaries are some of South Africa's most productive habitats. They are well known for their biodiversity, in particular their fish and invertebrate fisheries, and of course for their incredible bird life. Estuaries form the focal points for recreation, development and tourism and also provide essential services such as water purification and flood attenuation, supporting livelihoods and marine fisheries and providing feeding and staging sites for significant populations of migratory birds. Unfortunately, the estuarine realm is the most threatened of all realms in South Africa. Multiple interventions are required to ensure their future health and productivity, specifically around their direct management and the protection of freshwater input. There is also an urgent need to secure estuarine habitats against threats like mining, agriculture, and infrastructure development. And key to achieving these kind of interventions is an estuary's relative importance or protected area status, as protected areas promote better management and allocation of resources. And these can include options like marine protected areas, protected environments, nature reserves, amongst others. Currently, estuaries are underprotected in South Africa. Our estuarine important bird and biodiversity areas are the least protected of our IBAs in the Western Cape. And BirdLife South Africa has established a long term program of work focused on improving the form of protection and appropriate management of these key estuarine sites including working with private and communal landowners to gain conservation recognition for their biodiversity-rich lands through biodiversity stewardship. And pictured here 
are areas of the Birds of the Estuary floodplain, which are to, to be declared as part of an estuary protected environment in early 2021. Together with our government partners and other partner organisations, we have identified 13 estuaries for improved formal protection in the Western Cape. And our initial focus has been on the Berg River and the Clay River estuaries, ranked third and fifth respectively in terms of their conservation importance in the country. But aside from our work on increased formal protection of estuaries, the project also works towards the better, their better management in other ways such as through policy design and support by defending them when they're under threat and through our involvement in a number of environmental awareness and education initiatives. In fact, much of our work is geared towards producing tangible benefits for landowners and local communities through on the ground work. And working in our estuarine catchments, the focus is often on conservation or water conservation, including carrying out alien clearing, and on the ground at our estuaries, we are similarly engaged in habitat management, as well as supporting increased monitoring and crucial research. This includes projects such as our erosion control pilot project at the Berg River Estuary, which is trialing erosion control options and material construction aimed at restoring bankside habitats. And this kind of on the ground work creates local jobs, including SME development and training. By engaging with such a broad range of stakeholders in the estuarine space and delivering these multiple socio-economic and major positive benefits, the project works to secure long-term support for the better management and protection of our most important estuaries for conservation. And I'd just like to thank our many partners on the project. Without them, this work would not be possible. With a special thanks to our major funders, WWF South Africa, and the Rupert Nature Foundation. Thank you. Hi everyone, I am Karina Pinar, BirdLife South Africa's Angula Project Manager, and I will be introducing you to our grassland projects today. Currently, we have three active projects in three protected areas in the high altitude grasslands of the Eastern Free State, namely the Angula Nature Reserve, Sneerberg Protected Environment, and the proposed Upper Vilge Protected Environment. The Angula Nature Reserve is a project we have been involved with since forming the Angula Partnership with Eskom and the Middlepind Wetland Trust in 2003 to protect the wetlands and the white-winged flufftail, a critically endangered species. It's an 8,000 hectare reserve spanning the escarpment between the Free State and KwaZulu-Natal with grasslands, wetlands and indigenous forest pockets. We have recorded more than 340 bird species on the reserve through active monitoring and some specials you can expect to see include Denim's Busted, Yellow-Breasted Bibbit and Wattled Crane. Snowbird Protected Environment was declared in 2016, aiming to protect the grasslands and their biodiversity, including Rudd's Lock, Boota's Lock and Yellow-Breasted Bibbit, on working farms. It's about 17,500 hectares and currently protects the properties of 11 landowners. Similarly to Snewberg, the Upper Vilge stewardship area is aiming to protect working farms. It's currently in process of being declared and we hope to achieve formal protection in 2021. The proposed area is 24,200 hectares big and borders the Ingula Nature Reserve. 16 landowners are involved in this project and some of the species you can expect to see include Secretary Bird, Blue Coron, Blue Crane, Great Crowned Crane and Cape Vulture. The combined size of all three of these protected areas approaches an astonishing 50,000 hectares, which is a great achievement for our very threatened grasslands. Our activities in all three the protected areas include monitoring of birds and especially the presence and breeding of the 23 threatened species found here, engaging with stakeholders and landowners to ensure proper habitat management, species and habitat research, and environmental education and tourism guiding. Of the 23 threatened species in the region, we are involved in active research projects for especially our grassland endemics, including Rudd's lark, Buetta's lark, yellow-breasted puppet, and southern bulb ibis, raptors, including secretary bird and African marsh harrier, 
and all three hour cranes, which we do in collaboration with Endangered Wildlife Trust. There are two possible ways for you to get involved in our work in the grasslands. The first is through monitoring any southern bald ibis breeding or roosting colony you may be aware of. Breeding season is between September and December, and you can contact me to find out more about the project or whether there is a known colony near you. Also, if you know of any colonies, please contact us to make sure that we also include it in our database. The second way to get involved is through the Southern African Bird Atlas project. We have launched the Free State KZN Escarpment sub-project in 2019 with the aim of obtaining species coverage and distribution data for especially the threatened grassland endemics mentioned earlier. You can visit the website as displayed on screen for more information. If you are interested to find out more of in, about any of these projects, please contact me at the email address displayed on the screen. I hope you enjoy the rest of the African Bird Fair and have a wonderful day. Hello everyone and welcome to the 2020 African Bird Fair. My name is Carl Lloyd and I'm the Rock Jumper Fellow of White Wing Flufftail Conservation. My position is sponsored by Rock Jumper Birding Tours. I'm going to tell you more about the White Wing Flufftail Conservation Project, but before I do so, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the species itself. The White Wing Flufftail is one of nine Flufftail species endemic to Sub-Saharan Africa, meaning that the Flufftail group is only found on the African continent. The white winged flaftar has diagnostic white secondary flight feathers, which you can see in this picture here. These give the species its common name and is quite no uh, noticeable when you do have the chance to see the bird in flight. The white winged flaftar is extremely cryptic in behavior, which has made it very difficult to study the species biology. The white winged flaftar breeds at high altitude peat wetlands during summer months. And these sites have only been found in Ethiopia and South Africa. The white winged flufftails are wetland specialists preferring intact, healthy sedge meadows. It's still uncertain whether the bird crosses boundaries within Africa and particularly where the bird goes during winter months. And for those who are keen birders, you'll know that white winged flufftail is considered one of Africa's rarest birds to see. The white winged flufftail is listed as critically endangered, meaning that it is one step away from being extinct in the wild. In 2013, it was estimated that there were less than 250 individuals remaining in Africa, with about 50 individuals remaining in South Africa. Recently, researchers at BirdLife South Africa have found that Ethiopia can only support 55 breeding pairs. And this is mainly through the de degradation of wetlands, through overgrazing by livestock, and through the destruction of wetlands through human expansion or settlements. The most significant findings that BirdLife South Africa has made are the first breeding records of the bird in South Africa. This was made in 2018, and you can see a mother and her chicks. The bird's call was also recorded for the first time, and this has recently been published in Avian Conservation and Ecology. The white-winged flaftail acts as a flagship or ambassador species for the conservation of water and wetland resources as well as protecting habitat for other species of bird. It also provides a means of engaging with farmers that have wetlands on their land so that we can help them better manage their wetlands. The white winged flufftail also uh, provides a platform to raise awareness about water and wetland conservation, which we do through the Flufftail Festival. Going forward, in terms of research, we are going to be focusing on these four main themes. These are population dynamics, distribution, movement, and habitat requirements. The results from all of these different projects or studies are going to feed in to best practice guidelines, which can help us better manage the species habitat. In terms of conservation, we look at improving the conservation status of its breeding habitat, Currently, Middlepint wetland is the only site in the southern hemisphere where the bird has been confirmed to breed. We're also going to engage with farmers in the Greater Lark and Flay Protected Environment, which is located near Dalstrom in Mpumalanga province. And we are also looking at bridging the gap between local communities and private landowners by employing members of the community to build bird-friendly infrastructure. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the fair. Raptors are the most threatened group of terrestrial birds in South Africa. 
BirdLife has two positions dedicated towards the conservation of these apex predators, the Raptors and Large Terrestrial Birds Project, as well as the Vulture Project. And as you can see, roughly a quarter of South Africa's 80 raptor species are considered threatened. BirdLife South Africa's Secretary Bird Project started in 2011 and has tracked the movements of 15 juvenile secretary birds to understand the dispersal behavior, habitat use, and selectivity, as well as the survival rates of these young birds. This year, the secretary bird has been uplisted to endangered by the IUCN after notice noticeable declines in the birds' populations were observed. These declines are linked to large-scale alteration of open landscapes, as well as collisions with linear infrastructure such as power lines and fences. The first publication produced using the tracking data highlighted that the species relies heavily on privately owned agricultural lands used for the grazing of domestic livestock. And through the, the mechanism of biodiversity stewardship, we are helping to secure the essential unfragmented tracts of pristine grassland that this species needs in order to thrive. BirdLife South Africa is monitoring the presence of nests across the country. And if you know of any current or historical nests, please email melissa.whitecross at birdlife.org.za. To find out more about this project, please watch the full length webinar on Conservation Conversations, BirdLife South Africa's weekly webinar series, this coming Tuesday, the 8th of September at seven o'clock South African time. Another Raptor project is focused on the critically endangered Southern Banded Snake Eagle, a species which is estimated to have fewer than 50 mature individuals remaining within Northern KwaZulu-Natal. The species' biggest threat is the large-scale alteration of coastal forest and their adjacent grasslands into agriculture and forestry plantations, as well as the growing human settlements which are altering landscapes across Northern KwaZulu-Natal. BirdLife has been developing several distribution models to identify key remaining areas for the species where conservation efforts can be focused going forward. In August this year, a team traveled to Umtanzini and fitted two females with telemetry devices. This is the first time that these birds have ever been tracked and it will hopefully help us to unlock the movement and behavior of the species within a fragmented landscape and will help us inform future conservation decisions and strategies to help them. One of the other threats to the species is electrocution on pole-mounted transformer boxes. BirdLife South Africa helped ESCOM's KZN operating unit identify 62 high-priority transformer boxes in 2019, and these were then retrofitted with insulating cables to prevent the electrocution of wildlife. We are very grateful to ESCOM for this proactive mitigation of these dangerous transformer boxes, and this is a major win for conserving the Southern Banded Snake Eagle. The Taita falcon is a small cliff-dwelling raptor which occurs from northern Kenya down south to the Blyder River Canyon in South Africa. The species is listed as critically endangered in South Africa and globally vulnerable across Africa. The Taita falcon was first discovered by Andrew Jenkins in, so in South Africa in the late 1980s. The annual survey of the known Taita falcon population has taken place in December since 2006. The large cliffs make surveying the species challenging and the team makes use of a helicopter to assess the most remote cliffs surrounding the canyon. Even with specialized equipment, the birds are often viewed from great distances and for the time being, little more than observations are made. The two BirdLife South Africa species guardians, namely Andrew Jenkins and Anthony Van Sale, have dedicated their time to better understanding the population dynamics of this little species. The team, which is usually comprised of four people, have been able to locate seven breeding territories since 2006 and have recorded a total of 27 juveniles in the past 13 years. The population seems to be following a downward trend as only three territories remain in South Africa. BirdLife South Africa's Science and Innovation Program were able to model the factors affecting tighter falcons with the aid of data collected during the annual surveys. Two factors stood out as a cause for concern. The first being the negative influence of the larger lana falcons and the second being woodland, woodland fragmentation. Both lana falcons and woodland fragmentation can be attributed to the growing rural and agricultural de development surrounding the once isolated canyon. It is now time to focus our conservation efforts on the remaining habitats surrounding the canyon through stewardship and better land management practice guidelines. Following the call for more data on tighter falcons outside of South Africa, we are now planning to broaden our scope to survey the Nyasa region of Mozambique and once again survey the Patoka Gorge, which was once the African population stronghold. Thank you. Good day, I am Linda van den Hever, Vulture Project Manager at BirdLife South Africa. Our Vulture Project has got two main objectives, and that is to research and mitigate the impact of lead poisoning in South Africa's vulture species, 
and also the implementation of vulture safe zones in regions that have been identified to be key to vulture survival. BirdLife South Africa's LED project has been running since 2016 and during this time we have um, established that our vulture species, more than any other large terrestrial bird species in South Africa, are facing elevated levels of lead poisoning. We feel that Cape and Whiteback vultures are exposed to lead poisoning by consuming carcasses that have been shot with lead ammunition, and they are probably obtaining this um, as a result of unsafe wildlife management practices when offal or gut piles from hunting and culling operations are placed at vulture restaurants for the birds to feed on. We also have um, found out that lead poisoning is compromising vultures' ability to manufacture hemoglobin, and this is concerning that it may predispose the birds to anemia. Um, for this reason, BirdLife South Africa is actively promoting the use of lead-free ammunition. The Vulture Project's second objective revolves around the implementation of so-called vulture safe zones, and this is a form of stewardship where we approach owners of large properties and convince them to manage their properties in ways that are friendly to vultures. This includes implementing criteria such as the protection of vultures during breeding season, uh, using lead-free ammunition for hunting and culling purposes, to fit farm reservoirs with escape ladders which will help birds to escape, and also to send key staff for poison response training. This list is not exhaustive and there's a whole list of criteria that the properties have to adhere to and this list is obviously adapted according to each individual property. The first vulture safe zone that was declared in 2019 is Tualu Kalahari Reserve in the Northern Cape. But since then, BirdLife South Africa has also been negotiating with properties such as La Palala Game Reserve in the Waterberg and also Drumfield Nature Reserve in the Northern Cape and these properties will be declared as vulture safe zones soon. This year's bird fair also coincides with International Vulture Awareness Day, which also takes place on the 5th of September. And we want to celebrate this very special day by announcing the declaration of the new Zululand Vulture Safe Zone. This is the combination of two years of work and involves 16 properties. Um, the safe zone will stretch all the way from Pongola Game Reserve in the north, near the border with Eswatini, to Pinda Game Reserve in the south, which borders on Nkuzi Nature Reserve. It will include such gems as Belvedere Game Ranch, as also the magnificent Manyoni Private Game Reserve, and will encompass some of the key breeding areas for whiteback vultures in the Zululand region. BirdLife South Africa is extremely grateful to all the landowners and reserve managers involved, and want to congratulate them on their commitment to our vultures and to do everything possible to ensure that these birds continue to flourish in the Zululand region. BirdLife South Africa's Birds and Renewable Energy Project supports the responsible development of renewable energy in South Africa. The project was initiated in 2012 thanks to sponsorship from Investec Corporate and Institutional Banking. The project was introduced just in time to support the imminent boom in renewable energy developments in South Africa that was brought about by the introduction of the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Procurement Program. Our work is important because although renewable energy has lots of environmental benefits, most notably with regards to climate change mitigation and the improvement of air quality, it does have some downsides. Renewable energy can alter large areas or fragment natural habitat. It can even cause the direct mortality of wildlife. Birds and bats can be killed if they collide with the rapidly moving turbine blades. Associated power infrastructure can also present a risk of both collision and electrocution. Our aim is to ensure that renewable energy develops in a way that it does not compromise our life support system, nature. We develop guidelines for impact assessment and monitoring birds at wind energy facilities together with our partner, the Endangered Wildlife Trust, and a group of experts, the Birds and Renewable Energy Specialist Group. These guidelines have been successfully mainstreamed. They are accepted as an industry standard across South Africa and have been endorsed by key role players, including the South African Wind Energy Association. A recent achievement is that our guidelines are now reflected in national legislation and must be considered for all proposed wind energy developments above a certain size. 
Thorough environmental impact assessments are necessary to ensure that proposed developments are located in the right place and that they are managed appropriately. But it doesn't end there. We also need to test assumptions and, where necessary, improve future impact assessments and current mitigation strategy. And monitoring at operational wind farms in South Africa has already revealed some unexpected results. It's also alerted us to the need to revisit and improve some previously accepted mitigation recommendations. The Birds on Renewable Energy project seeks to support evidence-based decisions. We have therefore begun developing a series of guidelines for species most at risk. This is just one way that BirdLife South Africa helps bridge the gap between science and implementation. Operational wind farms in South Africa share their monitoring reports with BirdLife South Africa, and this allowed us to conduct a comprehensive national scale study of the diversity of birds killed by wind turbine collisions. The study confirmed that a large diversity of species are at risk of turbine collisions. Over 130 different species have been reported as fatalities so far, around 30% of those species that were exposed to the risk. This is a striking reminder that wind turbines and conservation are not always compatible, at least not in the same place. Like so many things in life, location is key. Nobody would want to see turbines on Table Mountain, and in the same way, location is key to minimise impacts on the environment. When wind energy was still very new in South Africa, BirdLife South Africa and the Endangered Wildlife Trust developed a sensitivity map for wind energy facilities. The type of information available and our understanding of impacts has been refined a lot since then. What hasn't changed is that we still aim to provide as much information as possible, as early as possible, to inform sound site selection. The amount of renewable energy generation capacity is set to increase almost sixfold over the next 10 years in South Africa. And despite the challenges, we believe that renewable energy is still a much better option than fossil fuels. And that with the right information and advice, renewable energy could set the standard for best environmental practices, inspiring other industries to follow. Hi there, my name is Robin Kalane, and I'm going to be presenting an overview of what the Science and Innovation Program does within BirdLife South Africa. The program currently includes myself and Ernst Retief, and was formally established in January this year. But the projects that I'll be presenting on span a period of up to five years um, and, and sat within the um, landscape program within BirdLife. The first project I'd like to present on is the uh, delineation of key conservation networks project. And the particular case study um, delineated the optimal conservation network for the protection of our threatened forest ecosystems in the eastern part of South Africa. Our study used three focal species to represent three different uh, threatened forest types, uh, namely bush blackcap representing the highland or high altitude escarpment forests, orange ground thrush representing the misbelt forests within the mid-altitudes, mid and spotted ground thrush representing the, the, the forest systems along the coastline. Uh, we used a combination of predictive modeling, extensive field um, data sets, as well as ecological circuit theory in order to delineate this key um, conservation network that includes core habitat patches, as well as the corridors connecting them that is essential for the persistence of these species and the systems that they inhabit. Two kind of um, practical conservation outcomes of this project that we synthesized from our results included firstly, a, a priority conservation network highlighting those sites that are irreplaceable and secondly an improvement network that highlights those sites that are currently in some form of, of, of lower quality but if focused and, and if focused on with through rehabilitation and restoration projects could contribute significantly to the connection and habitat integrity of the, the priority network. And this published, the study was published uh, this year in diversity distributions, which we're really happy just to get the results out there. And we've made these layers available to uh, conservation spatial planners within the given regions. Moving into the grasslands, another study that we've, we've managed to uh, publish and conclude this year, uh, centers within the, the Sunderbolt Ibis project. This is a, a species listed as vulnerable and is endemic to the grasslands of South Africa, Lesotho, and Swaziland. 
our study really wanted to answer two questions using a 10-year data set that Birdos Africa has generated through monitoring programs of breeding colonies. And the first question was, um, could we identify the primary cause of the range contraction of the species, the historical range contraction, uh, primarily in the Eastern Cape province, where they're almost uh, not represented at all from a breeding point of view anymore. Whereas in uh, the 1950s, there was an extensive uh, number of breeding colonies across the province, but also furthermore to the north in the um, northern extremity of the range in the Limpopo province. It's also been a southward range contraction. And our results highlight that it's not driven by historical climate change, as was thought and represented in some, some previous published works, but that the primary driver was um, more land use and extensive land use, so overgrazing and how that altered the system and ultimately led to a contraction in the south and northern parts of the range. The second question we wanted to answer was what led to colony collapse, a number of the colonies that we were monitoring over that time period um, completely collapsed and um, from a breeding point of view uh, we no longer logged any breeding individuals following certain years and the study really highlighted that the primary threat facing the species across its range but also the primary primary reason for colony collapse in these cases uh, was the expansion of woody vegetation within the home range surrounding these colonies and um, that included both indigenous vegetation in terms of bush encroachment as well as the spread of invasive alien woody components, primarily wattle species in this part of South Africa. And interestingly enough, conversely, our results showed that low in the expansion of low intensity agricultural land use types did not significantly impact colony survival. Staying within the grasslands, I'd like to just highlight one of the focal projects that I implemented in 2014 and have been involved with since then. For, for just over five years, and that's the Mesic Highland Grassland Project. And this project really revolved around trying to develop a tool that we could use to monitor, first of all, identify the key habitat patches remaining for three endemic uh, threatened grassland bird species, namely vulnerable yellow-breasted pipit on the top left, endangered Buddha's lock in the center, and endangered Rudd's lock in the bottom left of the screen. And um, over a three year period, we combined uh, extensive field surveys with uh, remote sensing or satellite imagery analysis, as well as predictive modeling frameworks uh, to come up with a tool that could identify patches with that, that could host the species as is displayed in the uh, map in the center bottom of the screen. Those red patches represent potentially suitable um, habitat patches based on grassland habitat states and a number of other variables. And, um, and then using this across time, we could start tracking how these habitats fare across years and ultimately where we should be investing our efforts as a conservation organization to promote the persistence of these species. If you do know these species, you'd know that there are huge knowledge gaps around where the species is distributed and how many individuals there are left. And this is ultimately what we were aiming to assess and answer and build tools around that we could use to monitor them going forward. We weren't just looking at the species, however, we were looking at the, the broader management of these ecosystems, which is obviously crucial in terms of keeping the species around. And in terms of a mesic highland grassland system, the two primary drivers that we were assessing included the use of fire and grazing, and, and what the optimum would be between those in order to uh, promote the persistence of, the of these three various species, as well as the other species that they represent as flagships. And we've um, kind of synthesized all of these results into best practice management guidelines that we're currently looking at publishing and uh, promoting on the ground through our stewardship initiatives. We've taken what we've learned within this project and expanded it uh, beyond the grasslands into the arid west of the country, primarily within the Nama crew, but also within the Suckland crew ecosystems. And I've once again used flagships, uh, endemic species as, as, as my my species um, that we use to, to identify the patches within which we work and conduct our studies. And in this case, it's centered around the vulnerable red lock, Slater's lock, um, Stark's lock, as well as Barlow's lock in the far northwest. Uh, I implemented or initiated this study in, in 2018 and um, have subsequently really been able to answer those key questions around where, where are these species distributed? We are the core patches and corridors that link those patches 
and what are the population status and trend of these species and what does it mean for us as an organization in terms of where we direct our conservation efforts. And some of the uh, applied conservation products that's come out of this, this, this study has included microhabitat mat mapping tools that we can use to uh, promote sustainable development across the Northern Cape, particularly uh, the expansion of renewable energy developments that have taken place over the, the last couple of years. And using these tools, we can uh, provide insights and um, guidance in terms of how best to, to place infrastructure to avoid those, those patches that are, that are crucial for the species. Sticking on the lines of the renewable energy um, sector, we've uh, concluded a modeling project at the end of last year around the endangered black area. And what we really were aiming to achieve here was refine uh, more broad scale distribution models for the species, as can be seen in the center top of the screen, to that of more fine scale models that more accurately represent breeding habitat, as can be seen in the top um, and bottom right of your screen. And uh, we've then taken it further to look at uh, the potential corridors that could connect these core breeding areas. And this is all fed into the Black Areas and Wind Energy guidelines that Sam Ralston has authored and um, for the renewable energy sector. And I've no doubt that this is going to make a huge impact for the conservation of the species, uh, particularly within the framework of uh, renewable energy developments and the impacts it has on this threatened species. Sticking with raptors, um, I recently had uh, the honor of finishing up a study using um, a 10 year data set on the critically endangered Titan falcon. Uh, it's a data set that was collected and uh, driven by the Tata Falcon team, namely Andrew Jenkins, Anthony Fonsale, um, Carl Walker, and Melissa Hose Whitecross, and uh, really centered around trying to identify what the drivers were of optimal breeding habitat for the species and what could potential factors be um, uh, that cause the disappearance of the species, as has been noted in some core strongholds across this range and, and definitely has sparked some um, uh, significant conservation concern around the status of the species. Some of our results uh, really just showed that the species warrants the conservation attention. It's highly susceptible and sensitive to habitat loss, particularly woodland fragmentation and, and loss of woodland habitat in general across its breeding range which then leads to these sites becoming unsuitable from a breeding point of view. It relies on very specific topographical features in terms of cliff lines within these systems. And um, there's a cumulative effect of as woodland um, are lost and fragmented through, through land use, um, a larger falcon species, namely a lana falcon, uh, seems to do better under those conditions. And therefore you have a cumulative impact, impact of not just the loss of the habitat, but of now uh, uh, interspecific competition with a larger falcon species that could outcompete it. Moving on to our focal wetland project that I've been involved in for the past five years, um, namely the Whiteland Flufftail project, two major milestones that we were that we just ecstatic about having concluded this year um, includes the publication um, of the vocalization status of the species. This is the first time that the vocalization has been uh, irrefutably recorded um, for the species since its description over 120 years ago and really ultimately allows us to to drive the conservation of the species forward now that we have a vocalization we can use in terms of our surveys going forward. It's a huge um, milestone for the project and along with that was the identification of the species breeding in its in its austral summer range in South Africa and essentially rewriting the books that the pre and the thoughts that previously stated that the species was a non-breeding visitor to South Africa. And the second milestone uh, linked to this particular finding, particularly the breeding finding, is that we now have increased hope of, of keeping this critically endangered species around. Uh, a study that we've just published this year in, um, in Ostrich highlighted the breeding, the, the availability of breeding habitat in a stronghold in Ethiopia in the Salulta and Berga floodplains. And worryingly, the results show that no less than, well, yeah, no, no more than 5% of its habitat currently is, is still in existence. That means that 95% of the breeding habitat across the core strongholds have already been lost through land use practices, primarily agricultural 
crops additional of, of natural um, sedge meadows um, that get drained and used for grazing purposes. And what this means is that currently the available habitat across these floodplains, um, according to our study, could host a maximum of 55 breeding pigs. So the fact that we've now identified uh, another breeding area in the southern part of this range, namely in South Africa, gives us hope that we could work towards making sure the species is around for future generations to, to enjoy. And then last but not least is the conservation modeling project. This has really been one of the um, kind of uh, key projects of the science innovation uh, program and Ernst and myself have been driving it and its aim is really to develop a fine scale habitat models for all terrestrial threatened species in South Africa. And we currently just this past week reached our first milestone, big milestone of having developed models for 40 terrestrial species, which is a huge feat. And when these layers get used, uh, there are plural value adds for the conservation of our birds from uh, making sure these layers get through to conservation spatial planners to make sure that these habitats are included in protected area networks through to guiding our conservation work in the areas that matter most through to guiding future research and surveys for some of our more secretive or, or, or species that have knowledge gaps. Um, and it's not just trying to understand where the best habitats are for these species in the present, but we're including robust climate change analysis, as we see in the bottom of the frame, to try and understand not only where the species is currently distributed and where those, ha those habitats and corridors are, but which of those are going to be the most resilient going forward and those are the ones we really want to be investing our time and conservation energies into. So this is a real um, a keystone project for our, our program, and I'm really excited about the, the potential uh, contribution this could make to the conservation of our threatened bird species. And um, yeah, I just want to thank all of our donors that have made this, this work possible. And uh, thank you for, for listening. And if you have any queries or questions, please don't hesitate to drop myself or Ernst an email, as can be seen at the bottom of the screen. We'd just like to thank all of our donors that have made this work possible. And if there are any questions related to any of these projects, please don't hesitate to drop myself or Ernst an email. Thank you for listening. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the African Bird Fair. My name is Daniel Marnuick, and I head up the Regional Conservation Program for BirdLife South Africa. Myself and my colleague, Bazeng Bazeng, will be talking to you today about the important work that we do uh, in supporting other African countries to conserve their most important biodiversity. And my presentation will be focusing on two of the tools that we use to achieve this, uh, namely key biodiversity areas and other effective area-based conservation measures. I just firstly wanted to introduce our team. That's me at the top there. Next to me is Dr. Bazeng Bazeng, who heads up the BASPA project. Next to him is the newest member of our team, Bronwyn Marie, who manages the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative. And we are supported by Hiral Nayak, um, who's not featured yet, but plays a very important role in the program. We use various international tools and frameworks to achieve our objectives and support African countries. And I'll be speaking about two of them right now, key biodiversity areas and OECMs. But firstly, let's just talk about the conservation challenge that we're trying to address. We all know that uh, the African continent is one of the most biodiversity rich in the world. However, by 2030, they predict that 90% of the world's poor will be living in Africa. To address this poverty, African countries are obviously going to rely heavily on economic growth, which is often resulting in the extraction of natural resources, the development of infrastructure, and the conversion of uh, natural habitats to agriculture. Now, this is particularly problematic in Africa because many African countries have not documented or map their biodiversity very well. And so they cannot guide and influence development and mitigate its impacts. So our program's theory of change is really built around addressing this challenge and, and helping African countries assess their threatened biodiversity, spatially prioritize the most important sites for that biodiversity, and then safeguard those sites. And obviously we also focus on a number of the um, underpinning enabling conditions for those countries to succeed at that. So I'm gonna talk about KBAs and OECMs and key biodiversity areas is a global currency 
for recognizing sites that contribute significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity. And this is a global unified system or standard that is backed by a KBA partnership that's constituted by 13 of the world's largest conservation NGOs who work in most countries across the world. The KBA standard is based uh, on five criteria. So a site could be recognized as a KBA for one or more of these five criteria and it's designed to um, accommodate any species or ecosystem. So it's a really dynamic standard that can, can recognize a site for its biodiversity value across a spectrum of taxa and ecosystems. There are a number of reasons why it's important for countries to recognize and identify a rigorous network of KVAs. And I'm just gonna focus on those four darker ovals. And that is that it allows countries to mainstream and influence um, various sectors and mitigate development impacts um, if they know where the most important sites are for biodiversity. It also helps them expand their protected areas and conservation area networks into these most important sites. Uh, it allows them to access international funding because this is a global currency that everyone recognizes. And this ultimately allows them to improve their management effectiveness because they now know what biodiversity they need to manage for. Now I'm gonna briefly talk to you about other effective area-based conservation measures or OECMs which found its origins in the Convention on Biological Diversity's 10-year strategy um, in target 11, where it says that the most important places for biodiversity should be conserved by a system of protected areas and OECMs covering at least 17% of terrestrial and inland waters. And we are fairly confident that OECMs will be in the next 10-year strategy from 2021 to 2030. The CBD also defined OECMs as a geographically defined area that is not a protected area, but which is governed and managed in ways that achieve positive and sustained long-term outcomes for the conservation of biodiversity. So this is really nice because it allows countries to recognize those sites that aren't protected, but that are still delivering effective conservation at a site level. And it obviously allows them to also engage with a broad stakeholder group, including the state, but also the private sector, NGOs, and, and local communities and indigenous peoples. So it makes your conservation estate far more dynamic. Then my last slide is really about the geographic space in which we work. And you can see the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative spans West Africa. Um, and Bronwyn and I have a specific focus in some of the SADC countries and in helping introduce key biodiversity areas and OECMs into those countries, particularly using transfrontier conservation areas as a springboard. And I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Bazeng Bazeng, to talk about um, his BASPA project. Thank you, Dania, for providing that overview. In the last few minutes of this presentation, I'd like to focus on the support the regional conservation program is providing to other African countries in terms of national rate listing and KBA. And this project is termed a biodiversity assessment for spatial prioritization in Africa and it's been piloted in selected African countries in partnership with BirdLife South Africa, the South African Biodiversity Institute and the IUCN Species Survival Commission. This project essentially aims to build and su to support and build capacity in African countries to mobilize foundational biodiversity information that can be used to monitor the status, the trends and the pressures on national biodiversity through the red list of species which is essentially identifying where your threatened and range restricted species are on the landscape, with the regis of ecosystems, evaluating ecosystems at risk of collapse. And in, in collapse in this sense, we mean ecosystems that cannot sustain their key characteristic features. And then using your red list of species and your red list of ecosystems to identify key biodiversity areas, which are essentially sites that contribute significantly to the persistence of global biodiversity like Daniel has mentioned. So uh, we undertook a comprehensive analysis on the African continent, identified priority countries, taking into consideration biodiversity. And in this sense, we looked at species richness and endemism, biodiversity, uh, institutional capacity, political will to mainstream biodiversity priorities. And through this exercise, we selected Cameroon, Gabon, Kenya, 
Ethiopia and Mozambique, but actively supporting similar initiatives that are being carried out in other African countries like Madagascar, Sierra Leone, Comoros, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe and Ghana. And I would like to just focus the last uh, few minutes to look at uh, Mozambique specifically. And in this case, in Mozambique, and working uh, closely with global programs like the Royal Botanic Garden, Q, Tropical Important Plant Areas, we have been able to train a cohort of young um, conservationists in Mozambique. And through this, we've evaluated the conservation status of um, plants, freshwater fish, birds, invertebrates, small mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. And these assessments <clears throat> have been published on the IUCN Red List and have been brought into the KBA process. And specifically in terms of the KBA support in Mozambique, we have helped them to establish what we call the KBA National Coordination Group, which is a group that coordinates uh, KBA identification, promotes its uh, protection, uh, conservation, and management. And we've been able to train the KBA National Coordination Group in terms of how to apply the KBA standards. And through this exercise, 30 networks of um, KBAs have been mapped in Mozambique. And one good example is, for example, the Mount Namuli. And you will see that is the network of, of, of the KBA. This is the network of the KBA with all the triggering species that are found within the KBA. All these uh, KBAs have been submitted to Daniel and myself, Daniel being the regional focal point of this area, and we've provided reviews, which have been submitted to the KBA National Coordination Group. Essentially, what we want to see in Mozambique is, we want to see all these range restricted and threatened species in KBA conserved and protected. We want to see this network of KBAs that have been identified informing uh, the protected area expansion strategy. We want to see the network of KBAs informing where large development should happen. And they said, lastly, we want to see Mozambique better report on both national um, strategies like the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans and International Biodiversity Commitment like the CBD, IG targets and Sustainable Development Growth. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew de Bloch, and I'm the AB Tourism Project Manager at BirdLife South Africa. I've been at BirdLife for nearly three years now. However, this is a fairly new role for me in the organization. I've only been in this new position for about four months now, uh, but it's very exciting and it's uh, quite different to what I was previously doing as the Penguin Research Project Manager. Now, AV Tourism might seem like a bit of an odd fit for BirdLife South Africa. We are at our heart a conservation organization. However, it clearly states in our mission that part of what we want to achieve as an organization is that we want to encourage people to enjoy and value nature. Of course, many of our stakeholders are bird watchers and birders at, in, in the country and further afield. So it's important that we look after and cater for their needs as well. The AV Tourism Project finds itself within the Empowering People Program. The Empowering People, people Program was a very new program. Um, it, it resulted from a restructuring that we underwent towards the end of 2019. At, at the moment, the AV Tourism Project is one of only two projects under this, but it is a program that we are looking to grow in the near future. So how does BirdLife support, support birders in South Africa? Now, as I've already said, our major stakeholders and a vast majority of our members and supporters are bird watchers and appreciate birds as part of a recreational hobby. Outside of the AV Tourism Project, there are a number of ways that we directly service birders. The first and most obvious is that we have a number of affiliated bird clubs. In fact, there are around 40 or more spread across the country. These are bird clubs that are affiliated to BirdLife South Africa, and we provide them with resources. We regularly give talks at their meetings and support them in their work. We also run the National Birding Big Day, which is a 24 hour race between teams all over the country, to see how many species they can see on a given day. This year it is taking place in late November. We also publish the African BirdLife magazine, which is a top class nature magazine dedicated to birds with contributions from the top ornithologists and birders from all over the African continent. 
We also host the South Africa Listers Club, which is the only platform for listers within the country of South Africa to post their totals and is very quickly growing, nearing on 300 members despite only being launched in February this year. We also published the official South African bird checklists, which includes all the names and scientific names, as well as the statuses of the birds that are taken from the Red Data Book, which is also produced by BirdLife South Africa. We also have the Rarities Committee, which vets all out of range records that are seen in South Africa that are important on a national level. We also run a number of birding events, as well as bird related events, such as the African Bird Fair, which you are attending right now. And of course, our conservation work of birds and their habitat can be seen as a service to birders as well. Now, Bird Life South Africa's AV Tourism Project has a number of sub projects. The first among these is the Community Bird Guide Project. And I'm going to speak to that in detail in a little bit. Other than that, we also have the birder friendly establishments and tour operators and membership schemes. These are subscription memberships that uh, accommodation um, establishments such as B&Bs and lodges all around South Africa and its neighbors can apply to be a part of. And there are a number of benefits to this, including getting access to our network, um, our substantial network of birders and nature tourists. And in response, the birder friendly establishments have to have sustainable practices such as sustainable water use, indigenous gardens and have to be able to cater for birders when they visit. Generally, they are also in some of the better birding areas in the country. Our birder friendly tour operators similarly also subscribe to our birding code of ethics and are committed to be using our BFEs, our birder friendly establishments and our community bird guides wherever appropriate and possible. I'm also involved more broadly in the development of avi tourism in Southern Africa. This includes promoting resources such as the Sassol Birds of Southern Africa book, which was launched on BirdLife South Africa's platform on the 9th of July just this year. I also have done a number of podcasts and presentations at international bird fairs to promote South Africa and Southern Africa as a birding destination. The Community Bird Guide project is a long running project and one of BirdLife South Africa's most successful and impactful. It started almost 15 years ago and in that time, we have trained over 200 individuals from previously or historically disadvantaged backgrounds to be professional bird guides. This includes a fully accredited nature guiding course, as well as specialist birding modules that are delivered. More recently, we have started to have a more entrepreneurial focus as the guides graduate from this program as fully fledged freelance guides. So it's important that they are able to sustain their own businesses. Many of our guides through their passion for birds that they grow as part of their training, have started their own conservation endeavors in their communities, whether that be leading school groups on birding walks and starting bird clubs in their communities or anti-litter campaigns and vegetable gardens. They've been real ambassadors for the environment and birds in their communities and the footprint of our project is much broader than we had initially anticipated. After their training, we also have a good relationship with our guides. As I said, they are freelancers, but being a BirdLife South Africa trained community bird guide has become something of a hallmark of excellence in the guiding community, and they are very much loved by our birding community. We also have a magnificent partnership with Swarovski Optic, who provide the guides with sponsored branded uniforms, as well as some of the top of the line optics and binoculars that they could wish to have. This helps the guides feel that they are really professionals in their own right, and also helps the clients to understand that they are serious bird guides and that they really, really know their stuff. So we thank Swarovski Optic for this very long-standing partnership now and a very generous and uh, very kind-hearted partnership that we have with them. We also keep them on our uh, WhatsApp groups and we help to market them to our various networks of birders and other tourists. Recently with the COVID crisis, of course, our guides have really struggled um, they've had close to no income for the last six months because of the national lockdown. And we had to be proactive about helping them out in this time of their need. BirdLife South Africa started the Community Bird Guide Relief Fund. And with this, we were able to raise just shy of 700,000 Rand due to the generosity of the birding community at large. So we thank you very much uh, on BirdLife South Africa's behalf and behalf of the guides for helping them in their time of need. Some of them are starting to work now that the national lockdown is easing. Please do go ahead and support all of these guides. They are phenomenal people, lovely individuals, and their birding skills are unparalleled in Southern Africa. 
please also support our birder friendly establishments and our birder friendly tour operators many of them who are our exhibitors at the african bird fair this year so we thank them for their support and we ask you watching this show if you are traveling around south africa birding consider supporting one of them they are really excellent thank you for listening and you can find more about the av tourism project by watching my full length webinar and under the AB Tourism Project at BirdLife South Africa's exhibition stand. Thank you. Hi everybody, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to round off the presentations by our conservation division by just giving you a very brief overview of the work of our policy and advocacy program. So this program is currently staffed by myself, Melissa Lewis, and Hiral Naik, um, who works part-time as our policy and advocacy program assistant. And Essentially, this is a cross-cutting program in the sense that it attempts to provide support for uh, BirdLife South Africa's um, other conservation division programs. And there are a variety of ways in which we do this. So the first involves attempting to integrate conservation objectives into relevant laws and policies. And we do that through monitoring, commenting on, and providing expert input into relevant legislative and policy developments. So just to give you one recent example of, of that, we've recently been working to compile comments on government's intended identification um, of so-called strategic transmission corridors, which would be areas uh, within which um, the ordinary uh, requirements for environmental authorization would not apply to the development of power line infrastructure. And so our comments in that context have essentially focused on attempting to ensure that birds and their habitats receive adequate attention in the standards that are envisaged to replace those requirements. So I want to highlight from the outset that the BirdLife Partnership doesn't only attempt to, to influence the development of domestic laws and policies. It also attempts to influence the development of regional and global laws and policies. So just one example of that would be the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which is currently working towards developing a post-2020 global biodiversity framework, um, essentially to guide states' efforts to conserve biodiversity into the future. Um, so in that context, BirdLife South Africa is participating in efforts to coordinate um, the BirdLife Partnership's positions on those negotiations. And we're also engaging the South African government um, in an attempt to inform its negotiating position um, and hopefully have an, in, uh, an influence on that, that very important framework. But obviously, um, even if one has very robust laws and policies on paper, uh, Ultimately, they're only as meaningful as their implementation. And so an important component of our policy and advocacy work involves developing strategically important best practice guidelines, uh, which are essentially aimed at supporting the improved implementation of South Africa's environmental laws and policies. Um, and we have two projects uh, of this nature at present. The first is a collaboration with the South African uh, National Biodiversity Institute. Um, and in that project, we're developing species environmental assessment guidelines. So to give you um, a bit of background um, on that project and its significance, some of you may already be aware that the South African government has developed a national uh, web-based environmental screening tool, which basically forms the first step of any environmental impact assessment in South Africa. So that tool identifies important and sensitive environmental features um, within a particular site and dictates what specialist studies need to be undertaken as part of the environmental authorization process. So a variety of protocols and associated guidelines are being developed to um, guide those specialist uh, studies and assessments. Um, and the guideline produced by this project will form part of that package of guidelines. The second project uh, is still in its infancy. It's a collaboration with the Endangered Wildlife Trust, um, which aims to build upon the first project by developing best practice guidelines on implementing the mitigation hierarchy in South Africa. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the mitigation hierarchy, uh, it's essentially a tool 
that seeks to ensure that development is genuinely sustainable um, by requiring that significant environmental impacts are sequentially avoided, minimized, rehabilitated, um, and then offset. Uh, now, despite South Africa's legislation um, requiring such a hierarchical uh, approach to impact mitigation, it, it, it often is not well implemented in practice, um, and so this project aims at addressing that. Okay, apart from um, attempting to improve implementation of South Africa's domestic laws, uh, BirdLife South Africa also um, works with government in an, attempt, in an attempt to improve its implementation of South Africa's international commitments. So just one example of that is that South Africa is a party to the African Eurasian Water Bird Agreement, or AWA. And AWA's current plan of action for Africa calls upon African parties to develop national implementation plans to um, support and improve national implementation of, of this treaty's commitments. Um, the South African government very recently embarked upon a process to develop such a plan, and BirdLife South Africa is, is one of the NGOs that's providing input on that process. Right, so moving on to our advocacy work. Um, this work essentially aims at safeguarding priority habitats and species by reactively addressing direct threats. Um, and we do that primarily by commenting on applications uh, for authorizations that could negatively impact key habitats and species, monitoring those cases, and then challenging uh, decisions on authorizations where this is appropriate. So our most high profile case in recent years um, has involved uh, our efforts to protect the Mabola protected environment in Mpumalanga um, from the threat of coal mining. And so we've worked on that matter in um, collaboration uh, with a variety of other NGOs as part of of the Mabola Coalition, uh, which is represented uh, by the Centre for Environmental Rights. And we're really fortunate to have that support in this particular case, um, because as, as I've tried to reflect in, in this table, um, the matter has involved challenging numerous approvals by governments over the past five years, both through pre-litigation appeals where those are available um, and through uh, actual uh, judicial proceedings. Um, so hopefully this gives you some kind of indication as to just how lengthy and complex an endeavor it can be um, to protect priority habitats and species through, through these advocacy efforts. So this slide um, just shows a few of the species that would be or are being impacted by various activities on which our advocacy work is currently focusing or has recently focused. Um, here again, I'll just highlight one example um, about which we're especially concerned and that, that involves um, the threat of prospecting activities directly adjacent to the Middle Pond wetland, um, which is the only confirmed South African breeding site for the critically endangered white um, white winged flatail. Um, so this is a matter which we are following and monitoring very closely um, and engaging governments um, in an attempt to ensure the protection of that, that species habitat. Okay, and then just a final point I'd like to raise in this presentation is that obviously uh, environmental policy and advocacy concerns arise in all countries um, and NGOs in many parts of Africa lack the capacity for confronting these um, that we have in South Africa. And so a component of BirdLife South Africa's policy and advocacy work involves supporting other BirdLife partners in Africa. Um, and one of the key ways in which we do that is by participating in the BirdLife Partnership's African Casework and Emerging Threats Task Force, or ASSETS. And this task force focuses on providing advice to partners in African countries um, which are faced with particularly significant threats to important sites. 
And then moving forward into the future, um, I'm also going to be collaborating very closely with BirdLife South Africa's newly appointed East Atlantic Flyway Initiative uh, Project Manager um, to provide policy and advocacy support to partners specifically along the East Atlantic Flyway um, in an attempt to enhance conservation measures in those countries specifically. Right, so that's all from me today. Um, I do recognize that that was a very rapid whistle-stop tour through BirdLife South Africa's policy and advocacy work. Um, but if you have any queries and would like any further information about any of this work, please feel free to give me a shout um, and I'd be happy to fill you in. Uh, thanks very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of, of the virtual bird fair. <laughs>